And welcome back to our example one AP Calc BC students from topic 10.4. We're going to take a look at our part B in our discussion of the integral test. So hopefully you had a chance to take a look at example 1A. Uh, in example B here, we're doing the same thing. We're going to confirm whether the integral test will be applied. And if it can be applied, let's determine the convergence or divergence. Now over here, you can see to the right, I've got the integral test criteria here uh, labeled uh, and copied and pasted and basically in a nutshell three things have to be true you have to equate a function to your nth term expression which is very easy just change the n's to x's treat it like it was continuous uh, has the potential to be continuous and then determine if indeed that function is positive all the time continuous all the time and decreasing all the time for x beyond a certain value m. And in this particular problem, our summation starts with 3, which might seem a little weird. But if you look a little bit closely at that uh, denominator, I think we'll understand why we needed to start it with something around 3 at least. So let's go ahead and go through our process. First of all, let's equate a function f of x to this expression a sub n. And what we'll just simply do is we're going to call f of x x over the square root of 2x minus 5. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start going through our criteria. Number one, is this function positive? Well, I feel pretty darn certain that f of x is positive. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Aren't those some x values? Aren't there some x values for which this could be negative? Well, okay, now let's think about this. If we let x be a negative number, yeah, maybe that numerator could be negative, but boy, the denominator gets all crazy because it's going to be an imaginary number. But wait, wait, wait. N's got to start with 3. So for 3 and beyond, I'm very certain that f of x is positive. Let's just make sure that we state for what values that's happening and in this case it would be for x greater than or equal to 3. Do you see how that 3 is that m? Right a lot of times it's a bit misleading because a lot of textbooks put a 1 here and I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't have a PhD in mathematics but I don't like that. So that's why I've reworded this just a little bit and hopefully uh, it still makes sense in the grand scheme of things. All right so we've got number one finished up. Let's look at number two. Is our function continuous? Well, again, I think you could look at that denominator and yeah, you could probably come up with some values that might cause some issue, maybe a zero denominator, but that's not going to happen. I don't think unless x is 5 over 2, right? 5 over 2 is going to cause some problems, but 5 over 2 is 2 and a half and we're not going to be able to be a value or have a value of 2 and a half because n starts at 3. So no other value is going to make this discontinuous, so let's make the proclamation f of x is continuous for x greater than or equal to 3. And again, notice how it's not like we're necessarily proving these things. We just have to write them down. Now for number three, this is the only one that I'm a bit of a stickler on with my students because I don't want my students just to proclaim that this is decreasing because it very well may not be. I think you really need to check this one especially. So I want, I really will need a little bit more unequivocal proof here. And we've talked about how there's a couple of different ways to do this. You can do this inductively or you can use calculus. And I think calculus is going to be the approach that I would like to take. In other words, I'm going to take the derivative of this f of x and I'm going to compute uh, or determine if indeed the derivative is equal to a uh, negative number all the time for this interval. And that would mean that f of x is decreasing. So uh, as I get this ball rolling here, um, I am going to uh, rewrite this. It's not imperative that a student do this, but I think that this could be a little bit easier. And I'm going to go this route. I'm going to rewrite that with a negative one half exponent and use the product rule here. If you are a student in my class and have access to my solution key, 
uh, the wonderful solution key that Mr. Ted Gott had uh, provided for me, you will probably notice that the solution there uses the quotient rule. So you have a great chance to see a couple of different approaches to this. So the derivative by the product rule would be the derivative of x, which is, of course, 1, multiplied by our 2x minus 5 to the negative half. And to that, we shall add x, multiply by the derivative of the second piece, and that would be negative 1 half times 2x minus 5 to the negative 3 halves. And then we multiply all this by the derivative of what's inside to complete the chain rule, which is a 2. At this point, this thing could use a bath. <laughs> it needs cleaned up. Let's kind of rewrite it so we can ex uh, disregard any extraneous terms. Over here, I'll bring this minus out to the front, this negative. Twos are going to cancel. I've got an x that pops in there. And then 2x minus 5 to the negative 3 halves. And at this point, we can factor out a common factor, which would consist of the smaller of the two exponents, negative 3 halves. That will leave us with a 2x minus 5 to the first power. Now, if you want to think about that, why is that to the first? I'll put parentheses in a 1 here, just to help. If I multiply this back through, when I add the exponents, negative 3 halves plus 1, it is negative 1 half. What do you say we get rid of those parentheses, though? And then I'll subtract, and just x is left here. And so now I can really clean this up. I end up with x minus 5 on top, and what essentially could be written as the square root of 2x minus 5 cubed on the bottom. And this should make things fairly easy for us to determine whether or not we are going to be a decreasing function. So I'm going to find my critical numbers. So f prime, of, uh, f prime is equal to 0 only when the numerator is 0. And that would be when x is 5. And then f prime is undefined. Well, we've talked about this just a little bit already. That's going to occur when that denominator is equal to 0. And if you cut right to the chase, that denominator is only 0 if the 2x minus 5 uh, is 0. The square root and the cube really don't have a big play in that. But the problem with this is that is x is equal to 5 halves, which we can disregard because our our domain for this problem doesn't really start until n is 3, which translates to when x is 3. So we only have the one critical number at 5. So we better do some testing here. We're going to start here at 3. I'll place 5 about halfway down the line. And let's see what's going on. So we're going to evaluate at, say, 4. So f prime of 4 is 4 minus 5, which is negative 1, hey, I like that, over the square root of 8 minus, uh, let's do 4, four eight, 8 minus 5, which is 3 cubed, what, square root of 27, hey, that's negative. I think we're in good shape, right? We, we probably don't need to check the other interval. Yeah, maybe we should. Let's check 6. So f prime of 6 is... 6 minus 5, which is, of course, 1, right? I'm plugging 6 in right here. And the denominator would be the square root of 12 minus 5, which is 7 cubed. Whoa, that's positive. And that is a problem. We no longer have this decreasing behavior for this problem, which simply means if this graph, if you think about this graph, if this graph is going to decrease for a while, and then decide to increase, then finding the area underneath it is absolutely pointless because that's kind of what we're doing when we integrate. And we're going to do this area, find this area all the way to infinity. There's not a chance that this thing is going to be able to behave the way that we want it to behave. And so for that reason, we're not going to uh, regard this as a problem that you can use the integral test for. So we'll just simply say, f of x is not decreasing on the interval. We'll just start with 3 to infinity. And that means that we can just simply say, therefore, the integral test does not apply. 
So I guess the good news with this problem is you don't have to integrate. But you still had to work a little bit in order to determine whether or not the test works. And that's just the way it goes with the integral test. It's definitely one of the more time-consuming tests, mostly because of this condition. All right, hopefully this helps out. We got another video in store for you for integral test in example one, part C. Be sure to check it out. Thanks for joining.